Hello, I'm Christopher, and today I'll be talking to you about disposal problems of radioactive isotopes. But before getting into that, let's get to know radioactive materials a little better. Now, radioactive decay is when the nucleus of an unstable atom emits high energy particles. It's a random process at an atomic level, and it's impossible to predict when a specific atom is going to undergo radioactive decay. However, for any it's possible to find the rate of decay for any larger quantities of radioactive elements, and this is called the half-life of the element. Half-life means that it's the amount of time it takes for half of the amount of the substance to decay. And since the half-life remains the same no matter how much of the substance is present, the less of the substance there is, the slower it actually decays, so it's exponential. So now that you know what being radioactive means, you're probably wondering what are the actual dangers of radioactive substances. But to understand the dangers, you must first understand the different types of radiation. Radioactive decay has three main types of dangerous emissions when considering storage and disposal. Alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Alpha particles are essentially ionized helium particles with a charge of 2+, plus, meaning that they have no electrons and they're just two protons and two neutrons. This kind of radiation is given off when a particle decays into an atom with an atomic number of two less than the original. For example, a uranium-238 atom decaying into a thorium atom and a helium atom with a charge of two plus. Alpha radiation is only dangerous if ingested, and it's easy to prevent any bodily harm from it. Now I'm going to talk about beta. Beta particles are the result of either a neutron decaying into a proton, or a proton decaying into a neutron. Neutron to proton decay is called beta plus, and beta plus results in the emission of a positively charged electron called a positron, but it doesn't occur in isolation. It needs energy to take place, so it's not really a problem when you're considering disposal. Now, beta minus, which is uh, proton to ne or neutron to proton, can take place in isolation and it results in the emission of an electron and something called an electron antineutrino. Any exposure to beta radiation can be dangerous, but it's easy to prevent damage from it just by wearing a specialized plastic suit, because it's difficult for it to go through anything, including plastic. Gamma radiation occurs after either beta or alpha decay has occurred, and it's the result of either alpha or beta particles trying to jump to a lower energy state. It's a very high frequency wave and is emitted by alpha and beta particles similar to how atomic elements can emit infrared, visible, or ultraviolet light to get to a lower energy state. Any exposure to gamma radiation is also extremely dangerous and because it's a wave and not a particle, it's harder to protect against. Workers dealing with gamma radiation need to wear specialized suits that protect against gamma rays. So now that you know the three main types of radiation, you're probably wondering why they're all dangerous. They are all something called ionizing radiation, meaning that they're so energetic that they can cause electrons to break off of stable atoms that they come into contact with. And it's this ionization that can cause damage to living tissue, leading to mutation, cancer, sickness, or even death. And the unit for measuring the dosage equivalent of radiation is the saver and it was originally intended to quantitatively evaluate the potential damage to living tissue by radioactivity. To give you an, to give you an idea of how much one sabered is, here are some statistics. A banana contains 0.1 microsieverts of radiation. The human body naturally has 0.4 microsieverts. The average background radiation a human is exposed to daily is 10 microsieverts. The limit release for a nuclear power plant for a year is 250 microsieverts. A mammogram is 3 millisieverts. Increase in risk of cancer later in life is evident at 100 millisieverts over one year. The dose limit for radiation workers working on a life-saving operation is 250 millisieverts. 10 sieverts is a fatal dose. The amount of radiation at Chernobyl for 10 minutes after the disaster was 50 sieverts. This here is called a pancake gamma reader. 
It's used for measuring radioactivity. So I have a few uh, radioactive minerals here, and I'm just going to show you how this works, basically. So I'm just going to turn it on now. And that beeping is just a little bit of background radiation, and also from me moving it around, so it's nothing. This is something called samarskite, and it's an oxide that's made up of several earth elements. So I'm just going to show you what happens when I bring this near. This one is something called carnonite. It's made up of vanadium and uranium. It's slightly less radioactive than the last one. And now I'm going to show you what happens when I slip a piece of galena, which is mostly made up of lead, this is it right here, between the reader and uh, the uh, mineral there. So. so that's about the reading, the highest reading that we're going to get from this. And I'm going to slip the lead in there. and it goes down. Because since lead is very dense, it deflects the gamma rays and prevents them from reaching the head of it, which means that it detects less radiation. Now that you know a little bit more about what the different types of radiation are, I'm going to start talking about disposal. There are, in Canada, there are three uh, classifications of radioactive waste, high level, intermediate level, and low level. Low-level waste is usually made up of parts of old reactors, medical waste, and byproducts of the uranium extracting process. It's relatively easy to dispose of. To dispose of low-level waste, it's first either incinerated or compressed, then buried in a shallow landfill for 10 to 50 years so that it can decay to safe levels. It's then relocated to a regular landfill. Intermediate-level waste is usually waste that's too dangerous to, dis to be disposed of the same way as low-level, but not quite dangerous enough that you need to take all of the precautions of high level. So, what they do with low level is they split it into two categories. Low half-life and high half-life. The waste with a low half-life is treated the same as low level waste, except it's kept buried for longer than low level waste. And the intermediate waste with a high half-life is disposed of the same way as high level waste, but they don't keep it in storage for uh, the 10 years that you need to for high level. High level waste is extremely dangerous, and it's mostly made up of spent nuclear fuel and disarmed nuclear weapons. It makes up a very small percent of the total amount of nuclear waste in the world, but it also accounts for more than 90% of the total radiation of all waste in the world. But for treatment, there are two main stages of disposal. The first is short-term storage. Since, uh, since half-life means that it decays exponentially, the first 10 years of storage are extremely important, because during those 10 years it loses a lot of its radioactivity, and that's why it's recommended that you store it for up to 10 years before you dispose of it. Now under disposal. High-level wastes generally have extremely high half-lives of up to 20,000 years meaning that when they're disposed of, they need to be put somewhere that they won't be able to escape to the outside environment from any accident, geologic occurrence, or removal by a group of people intending to reuse it. Typically, the places chosen for disposal are deep underground in areas that aren't prone to any geological activity. There's also one other way to treat high-level waste, but it's more expensive and not as common. It's called transmutation. Transmutation is when radioactive elements with high half-lives undergo a series of controlled reactions to be converted into elements with lower half-lives. The resulting elements are still radioactive and need to be disposed of as high-level waste, but it speeds up the decomposition process. In conclusion, although there are many dangers to working and disposing of radioactive material, most problems have been taken into consideration, 
and if all the necessary safety precautions are being taken, nuclear energy is still a safe and reliable power source. The end.